evening. Welcome to tonight's ASES Virtual Fellows Series. This is a, this is a product of immediate past president Bill Levine's uh, idea of a practice management series. Myself and Sa Samar Hassan will be your hosts and manning the chat room. Tonight's session is on rules of IME and legal evaluation. Our speakers are, are, are Evan Letterman, Kevin Shea, Matt Salzman, and I will, um, I will uh, hand, hand, hand it over to, uh, I, I'm sorry, as well as Dr. Andrew Green. I apologize, Andrew. <laughs> um, and I hand it over to Evan Letterman. Evan? Hello, all. It's our pleasure tonight to present to you on independent medical evaluations and what you need to know to get started. We have a great uh, panel of uh, speakers um, today. Um, Kevin Shea from UConn, Matt Salzman from Northwestern, Andy Green I'm from Brown, and I'm from Arizona. Uh, we're going to start out with a case and then get into several lectures and go through a few other uh, representative cases to discuss how to interface uh, with the legal system doing independent medical evaluations. So our first case is a gentleman who's 54 years old. He's right-handed male. He's an elevator, elevator repairman who requires at least 100 pounds of lifting on a daily basis. He was lifting and reaching forward uh, when he had acute onset of shoulder pain. He had limited range of motion and limited strength. He had an MRI showing a rotator cuff tear, and he had about one month of conservative care from an occupational medical clinic. And then the treating surgeon at the time took him to surgery and found a big tear to no one's surprise and deemed him unrepairable. He was then seen for evaluation at this point by myself uh, and had limited range of motion and weakness. And after going through the options for treatment, the consideration was for a superior capsular reconstruction. And then an IME was requested by the industrial carrier. So what does that mean to you as a treating physician? And what does it mean to be the IME physician when you're doing an evaluation? So we're gonna start our talk with Matt Salzman who's gonna go through the basics of the independent medical evaluation. Great, thank you very much, Evan, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Matt Salzman. I'm from Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the privileges that I have in Chicago is taking care of the Chicago Cubs. I'm one of the orthopedic consultants. And as many of you guys know, this involves game coverage, spring training, coordination of treatment, and serving as a conduit to the trainers and general manager. And what I would uh, tell you is that this offers a very unique perspective to the treatment of orthopedic conditions. Next. Um, culminated in 2016. Slide, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go to the next one. Um, so I show this just because if, if the video plays on the next one, Evan, this shows the seventh largest gathering of human beings uh, in history. So go ahead to the next slide. And um, this is obviously something that's sort of unfathomable in the middle of a, a global pandemic, never seen so many people uh, together. And if you go to the next slide, Evan. We fast forward to, to 2020. Um, this is what the Wrigley Field looked like um, during one of the games I was covering. Um, so start, quite a stark contrast. Next slide. And so the reason why I bring this up is because when you think about taking care of an athlete, that athlete has a lot of different people that influence that, that individual. This includes teammates, the front office staff, manager, sports agent, the treating doctor, and then of course, oftentimes a second opinion doctor. Next. And if we think about an injured worker, um, this is not dissimilar. You have a treating doctor, you have an attorney that's often involved, you have a work supervisor that's trying to get that injured worker back, an adjuster, a case manager, and then of course the IME doctor. And we're gonna talk more about the IME doctor tonight. Next. Um, so one of the basic questions you have to ask is what qualifies you to do an IME? Well, I would argue that you need to be an expert in the field. So that could be shoulder, elbow surgery or something else. You absolutely need to treat patients with the same condition that you're performing the IME for. You need to exhibit integrity in the community and you should have a proven track record for providing quality reports. Next. Um, before I start an IME with a claimant, I like to set the ground rules. It's very important to remind them that it is an independent examination. And what that means is that you are not the treating physician. It's perfectly fine to have a family member and or an interpreter in the room. And I would say you should always have an interpreter if there's any question whatsoever. Uh, for me personally, I do not think it's okay to video or audio record the examination. I've been asked that and I just simply don't allow it. I'd rather skip the examination. 
Um, and I tell them very explicitly, I will not be offering any treatment advice uh, during the visit today. You'll still be following with your surgeon. Next. And so a very common question that you get over and over from the injured worker is why am I here? And the simple answer is because a work comp carrier would like me to answer some questions regarding your injury and treatment. I tell them that I treat many patients with conditions similar to the one that they have, and I'm here to provide some guidance to them. Next. Um, and so uh, I also go on to tell them that I've read through the file, I'm familiar with how you injured yourself and the treatment that you've had to date. And so our goals in the room are actually pretty simple. You wanna confirm the history details that you've already reviewed and you wanna perform a focused physical examination. Next. And so one question that I get all the time is why is the time in the room so short? Sometimes these examinations cost a fair amount of money and you're actually not in the exam room for that long. And one of the reasons for that is that the medical records are all reviewed prior to the examination. The imaging is reviewed prior to the examination. There's no treatment advice given during the visit and there's no counseling on treatment options. And then the bulk of it is a report that's written after the visit is concluded. Next. And this is very different than when you're treating visits. So if you're treating a patient, not doing an IME, this visit involves building rapport and gaining trust with that patient. I always like to review imaging studies with my patients in the examination room, and this is not necessary very often when you're doing an IME. Um, you need to spend a lot of time discussing treatment options when you're treating somebody, answering questions, and then of course, there's a lot of discussion about planning subsequent steps and planning subsequent visits. Next. And so one of the tenets of an IME is how do you render an opinion? And there's a lot of different things that go into this, but one of the big ones for me is a mechanism of injury. Do you wanna know, is this a, just a mere manifestation of disease? Was this gonna happen no matter what, or was there a specific mechanism of injury that could have caused this worker to be injured? Uh, imaging, is there a structural injury or not? Is there a rotator cuff tear? Is it seemingly normal? Has the treatment been reasonable? And then you need to understand what the natural history of the disease process is that's in question. And then one of the questions that you'll always be asked is, is a claimant at MMI? Next. And MMI means maximum medical improvement. This means that any further treatment is unlikely to help that person get further along. They've sort of maxed out their treatment and this is as good as it's gonna get. And in order to render the opinion whether they have MMI, you need to understand the natural history of certain shoulder conditions. So if we focus on shoulder, a shoulder strain should get better in three months or less. A rotator cuff tear that's treated non-operatively, generally three months is a reasonable amount of time, in my opinion, to treat that before they're at MMI. Rotator cuff repair surgery, MMI should be around six months. That's different if it's a revision rotator cuff repair, I'll often give them up to 12 months. Labral repair surgery, somewhere in the four to six month range, and shoulder replacement surgery, MMI is typically around one year following that procedure. Next. Um, one of the things that you also need to be on the lookout for is signs of deception. And this includes a history uh, or symptoms that are incongruent with the disease process. So if you know they have a full thickness rotator cuff tear and their primary complaint is numbness or tingling, we know that that's not consistent with the rotator cuff tear. Additionally, if there's a lot of muscle guarding and they're really not able to lift their arm at all and you know they have a, a normal MRI, that's a sign of potential deception. And then if they have giving away weakness where they really don't resist you at all, you should be thinking about deception. And sometimes there's even a smoking gun. You may have a surveillance video that's forwarded to you that will show somebody doing a lot more than what they're showing you in the examination room. And that may be obviously a sign of deception. Next. Um, so as far as the report, this is really important. I like to dictate the day of the examination, ideally not always possible. I really try, strive to do it if I can. Um, it's important to go through the records and actually give a very thorough description of the records, not just do bullet points, but say, what are the pertinent details that you reviewed? You wanna go over the history and the comprehensive physical examination, obviously. And then you wanna answer each of the questions that are posed to you uh, based on a reasonable degree of medical and surgical certainty. And this actually varies state by state. For instance, in Illinois, it's a 51% chance. So you do have some leeway there, but you need to understand what the legality of that is in whichever state you're practicing. I always like to elaborate on my responses. I, if you're asked 10 different things, I never say see previous response. I really try to answer it over and over again. I think that that reiterates your point and probably um, calls for a stronger report in my opinion. And then obviously you wanna proofread the report, make necessary edits, make sure that you're not saying something that you didn't intend. Next. 
So what am I really looking for when I perform an IME? Well, range of motion, is the claimant stiff or not? Weakness, do they have rotator cuff weakness or not? Is the physical examination congruent with the MRI findings? The IME doctor really has a distinct advantage. They know the history from the medical records. You don't have to just rely on the patient, which is typically what you do when you're a treater. And you also know the medical imaging findings. Is there a structural tear or not? So you know that going into the examination. Next. Um, so common things being common, if somebody sustains a shoulder injury and their MRI looks like the one on the left, that's a normal MRI. That could be a rotator cuff strain. There's no structural uh, change or no structural tear in the rotator cuff. And that's different than the image on the right, which obviously shows a full thickness rotator cuff tear retracted to the middle aspect of the humeral head. Next, please. Um, so what about pre-existing conditions? Well, you need to rely partially on the patient's history. They're going to tell you um, most of the time I've never had any pain before, but sometimes they'll say, yes, I had surgery 10 years ago, or I had another work injury that was you know, five or 15 years ago, whatever it may be. Uh, but you can also use the MRI, particularly the shoulder to help um, indicate uh, chronicity. So that same rotator cuff tear that we just showed, we see the tendons retract to the middle of the head. And if you look at the T1 sagittal images, you can see pretty profound grade two, grade three changes of the muscle bellies of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. And so in that situation, if that MRI was taken right after the injury, you know that that's a chronic tear. Next. Um, so my final advice to you guys, and this will take a little while to get used to, I'm still learning every day, uh, but some basic tenets that I would leave you with is be honest in your opinion, don't evaluate something that you don't actually treat your patients for, be thorough in your evaluation and report, and absolutely don't say something that you would not want to testify to under oath. Thanks. Great job, Matt. That was really an excellent uh, presentation on how to do an IME. Uh, let's move into our second talk. Uh, Kevin Shea from UConn is going to talk to us about determining causation as well as a few other uh, important things. Thank you. Um, uh, this is really a, a thing we don't talk about very often. So I'm really uh, kind of excited to put some thoughts together and actually for the first time put on paper the way I do things. Next slide. So um, as Matt talked about, there are many different reasons that you may do an IME. You wanna know what the diagnosis is, what, the, uh, what your recommended treatment course is, or you may comment on the treating doctor's treatment course, MMI, uh, permanent partial impairment and disability, and uh, causation. In other words, whose fault is it? And that's oftentimes a big part of an IME. Next slide. Um, occasionally it's straightforward, but often it's subject to debate and there really is no standard method of determining causation. And as Matt brought up, and I'm sure Andy will bring up too, it relies on your knowledge and experience of the condition that you're treating. And ultimately, and this is an odd thing, it's the causation will be decided by lawyers and a work comp commissioner. This is not a medical decision. Uh, they will take your opinion under advisement, but at least in the state of Connecticut where I practice, uh, everything is determined by the commissioner and the usual and customary and not necessarily by medicine. Next slide. So as I thought about it, um, these are the, the buckets that I oftentimes put causation into and uh, maybe the panelists can put other things. Um, that's, this is a, a list and we don't need to read it because we're gonna go over each case. Uh, next, please. Before you determine causation, as Matt brought up, review all the medical records and especially prior injuries and conditions. When I go into a room, I have a list of questions that I've been asked by the uh, insurer and I wanna have my questions prepared. I wanna be a focused uh, exam, a focused history. And uh, you're, so you're gonna perform your history, do your exam, look at the images and arrive at your diagnosis. And a couple of other things, if you don't, if you need additional information, ask for it. I'm never bashful about saying, I cannot render an opinion unless I get this. Um, and ultimately you have to answer this question. Was the condition that you've diagnosed caused by the alleged events? Uh, next slide. So sometimes it's easy. Um, somebody falls off a ladder, gets a proximal humerus fracture, needs a plate. 
uh, there's clearly a direct causal connection between this work-related event and the injury retreating. Usually, if it's this simple, you're either asking other questions or they're not asking for an IME. Next slide. This is one that comes up all the time in our world. Repetitive trauma, typing, overhead work, repetitive lifting, did that cause the rotator cuff or the biceps condition? Um, there's very little written about this in the uh, medical literature. I'm sure Evan's got the Scandinavian uh, Journal of Work Environmental Health on, in his office, but, but we don't. We actually have to look it up from time to time. And that's about the, the best article if anybody really is interested in uh, maybe putting some science uh, to repetitive trauma. What I do when I'm trying to render an opinion is I look at the percentage of time that they're lifting overhead. I think nobody really has repetitive trauma to their rotator cuff on their, unless they're lifting above their shoulder level. But again, that's my opinion. And there's nothing written in the literature to back that up. I look at the number of years of the job. I don't believe you can get osteoarthritis of the shoulder from repetitive trauma. Um, we'll talk about the knee because I do a lot of knee uh, IMEs too. I think you can get a cuff problem, a biceps problem um, from repetitive trauma. And again, I think this is more professional judgment, which is why your opinion seems to uh, get a, become a lot more valuable the number of years that you're in practice. Next slide. This is one that comes up a little bit more and more, degeneration over time. Again, I said, I don't believe, and I haven't found any literature to support uh, the fact that you can get repetitive, you can get osteoarthritis of the shoulder from repetitive trauma. And again, maybe the other panelists will educate me tonight. There's significant evidence that if you work on cement floors for 25 plus years, you can get osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, but again, I'm not aware of any evidence linking OA of the shoulder or the elbow to occupational exposures just because of repetitive trauma. Next slide. However, aggravation of a pre-existing condition comes up an awful lot. The guy who falls off the ladder and you're just gonna keep saying, seeing the same cases just in a different context. Um, and then he either gets a symptomatic cuff arthropathy or his OA becomes painful. Well, it's quite clear, as Matt said, when you take the x-rays at the initial trauma, that there was pre-existing cuff arthropathy, there's pre-existing osteoarthritis. But the question, at least in the state of Connecticut, that we always ask is, did the symptoms immediately begin after the event and then they continued? If, they, if not, then most condition, uh, commissions recognize that the event would aggravated or activated the condition. My slide's wrong. If the symptoms started immediately and there's no pre-existing complaint, at least in the state of Connecticut, this is an aggravation of a pre-existing condition and there's felt to be a causal relationship between the need for treatment and that work injury. Next slide. Finally, Let's say 20 years ago, Matt does a scope on the guy on the left and he sees this degenerative head. The patient recovers and then goes back to work. And then he presents to his doctor with a cuff arthropathy or osteoarthritis of the shoulder. In, at least in our state, and again, the, the theme will continue, uh, things vary from state to state. If you have an injury that had a significant articular cartilage injury in the shoulder or more often in the knee, you had a meniscectomy and you had chondral damage, and then you develop a painful arthritis later on, then this is an accepted substantial factor in the need for treatment. Next slide. So some things are clearly not related. If you show up with a necrosis of the humeral head um, and you're not working in a steroid factory, um, you've got PVNS, you've got um, 
uh, OA from something else, and then it's not connected. And this is where the value of pre-existing records are. I saw a guy that claimed he needed a knee replacement for after a work-related car accident. And it turns out that in the car accident, he was on his way to his pre-op for his knee replacement. And uh, so uh, he just getting the pre-existing uh, records can oftentimes help in elucidating whether it's related or not. Next slide. So when you're, when you're dealing with causality, it's important, and Matt brought this up in terms of integrity, give an opinion you can support. If you can't reach an opinion, say so. Ask for additional records, imaging, records from the PCP prior to the injury. You may need something else to help you come to an, a conclusion. And don't overreach, because as we'll talk about, when you get to a deposition, the worst thing in the world is if you overreach and then you have to backpedal. You, you lose standing with the commission and your opinion doesn't mean as much. And this is really key. And I'll say this again at, in a deposition. Remember, you're the only one on your side. The lawyers are on their side. And you may be there testifying uh, and we'll in, in the deposition for one side for whom you did the IME, but they don't care about you they care about their case. So you need to be there to protect your reputation because that's all you have when the IME is over and it's your reputation that's gonna drive your IME business. Uh, next slide. So uh, we're gonna shift. I was also asked to talk about preparing for a deposition. Um, next slide. So what's a deposition? Well, it's a legal process in which you answer questions under oath. And the primary purpose is to, for one or both sides to discover what your opinions are and to fix them in time so you can't backpedal later. Um, in some states, Connecticut's not one, the IME alone may not be admissible and you need to testify about what you said in order to get it onto the court record. It's probably more true in a personal injury setting than in a work comp setting. Uh, all questions about your qualifications, everything is fair game. And one or both sides may try to push you into altering your opinions. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna go through this briefly because I, I think I'm overstretching my time. When you prepare for your deposition, you wanna have everything together. You wanna be familiar with the case. Um, you wanna bring paper. You don't want somebody having access to your computer. You may wanna meet with the IME attorney. Matt said something earlier, you want to disclose yourself as an expert. The attorneys don't know what being a member of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society means, but it should mean a lot because the guy on the other side often isn't, and that will elevate your standing. Um, and just from a business standpoint, have a cancellation policy in writing. The lawyers are not hourly workers, we are. And they love to cancel things at a moment's notice. We can't simply schedule things in 24 hours notice. So my cancellation policy is you pay full boat if you cancel within a week of the deposition, um, except for you know uh, very, very specific reasons. Next slide. Um, during your deposition, um, you wanna have everything right in front of you. You wanna be familiar with it. Uh, oh, this is the same slide. There we go. What's your role? So first of all, don't be in a rush. The attorneys know it. And if you're in a rush, they're going to prolong it just to get you uh, in a bad spot. All right. Do it away from books and journals that they can ask you to reference. Um, consider all of your answers and don't let yourself get trapped. Sometimes you start to hurry and a very quick answer is, be, can become problematic later on. Next slide. Ask for clarification. It's amazing how many times when you say, you know, I didn't really understand that question. Will you repeat it again? That they ask you a different question. If they ask you the question several times in the same, uh, uh, in a different manner, point it out. 
Yeah, they hate that. If you don't know, say so. Don't make stuff up. And don't fight if you have to concede a point, because again, it will come back to bite you later on. Don't exaggerate. It will hurt you in the end. Next slide. And finally, this shows up in my depositions a lot. Mark Twain said, you never have to remember what you said as long as you tell the truth. So if you're not inventing anything in a deposition, uh, you're fine. The more you stretch it, the more you have to think about what you said 30 minutes ago in order not to contradict yourself. And finally, as I said before, after the deposition is over, all you have is your reputation. When you first start doing this, you're always in the back of your mind. You want to say, oh, God, I really got to support these guys so they send me more cases. That's a bad thought. All right. You want to stick to your reputation. And if you can't support their side, that's fine. You're supporting your own side. And if, if you uh, listen to nothing else that I said, the two points on this slide are the most important when you go into a deposition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shea. I think we should all listen to everything that you said because that was a fantastic talk about it. We'll move into our next talk. Uh, Andy Green um, from Brown will go over impairment ratings. So thank you for the opportunity. I think, guess you can all hear me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about impairment rating. My goal is to provide you with an overview of what impairment rating is and cover the major concepts that are re relevant to orthopedic surgery specifically shoulder and elbow, but um, with the time constraints, I'm not gonna get to some details that are also very important. And what I'm gonna try to do is address the what, why, when, who, and how. So next slide, please. So impairment is defined as a significant deviation, loss, or loss of use of any body structure or body function in an individual, individual with a health condition, disorder, or disease. And this includes all organ systems in addition to the musculoskeletal system and for our purposes, I'm gonna focus on upper extremity. Next slide. So an impairment rating is an evaluation that's performed to determine a quantitative estimate of the losses to an individual as a result of their health condition, disorder, disease, and attempts to um, a link impairment with a quantitative estimate of functional losses in one sphere of activity. So the things that you typically do in your daily life. And impairment is, reported as a percentage of loss. Next slide. And it's not to be confused with disability. Disability is activity li limitations or participation restrictions that result from a health condition, disorder, or disease. And I, I found these the other day. These are emojis for different types of disability. Uh, next slide. But there, there is a complex relationship between impairment and disability. Uh, there, is, there may be a strong association between injury and the degree of functional loss that we measure with impairment. Um, and the extent of an injury may predict the ability to participate in life function, may, may not predict the ability to participate in life function if appropriate accommodations are made. And I think we're all aware that disability is strongly influenced by physical, psychological, and psychosocial factors. Uh, and this is different than impairment. Impairment's uh, a quantitative assessment of loss. Uh, next slide. And impairment rating is one of several determinants of a disability determination, which we're not going to talk about, and is integrated with contextual information that's typically obtained from other non-physician sources, such as psychological, social, vocational, and avocational sources. Uh, next slide. So I think this is a very important uh, book. It's the AMA Guides to the Evaluation of Permanent Impairment. And it's currently in the sixth edition and it gets revised every so often. Uh, and it's really generally considered the standard and accepted in most states for determining impairment uh, ratings. Uh, next slide. But obviously the guide's not perfect. And the authors of the most recent uh, edition said, the authors of this chapter, reckon, and this is the musculoskeletal, recognize that the process described is still far from perfect with respect to defining impairment or the complexities of human function. However, the author's intention is to simplify the process to improve interrelator reliability and to provide a solid basis for future editions of the guides. And it's been interesting over my career to see some of the changes that have been made, particularly for the evaluation of impairment of the shoulder and upper extremity. Uh, next slide. 
So why? Uh, so impairment rating is performed uh, to enable a patient with a, to transition from the status of temporary to long-term disability. And I'll get into the details of how that happens. And in many cases, an impairment rating is used to determine the financial compensation to patients who have suffered measurable physical and or psychological loss. Uh, next slide. So when do we do an impairment rating? An impairment evaluation is performed when a patient is at MMI, uh, and this typically in a workers' compensation case, very common mm -hmm. in my practice, but it's also uh, applies to federal employees' compensation and longshoremen and harbor workers, the Compensation Act, which I also have some experience with because Electric Coat has a big uh, site in Rhode Island, and then also automobile and personal injury claims. Uh, next slide. So um, I think uh, Matt or you know, I'm not sure what's Matt or Kevin touched on this, but maximum medical improvement is the point at which a patient is considered to be at, uh, as good as they're going to be and that no further medical or surgical intervention is expected to improve the condition. Now, there is some accommodation for potential de deterioration over time or changes over time, but generally maximum medical improvement is when the treatment that they're undergoing is done. Uh, next slide. So who performs evaluations? Uh, generally, it's a licensed physician, depending on the state. It could be allopathic, which is most of us, osteopathic or chiropractic. And then it's either going to be a treating physician or an independent evaluator. And I think that also may uh, vary by state. In Rhode Island, it's very common for the treating physicians to provide an impairment rating on a workers' compensation case. And at least in my experience, they're rarely contested. Uh, next slide. So how is this done? Uh, just like an IME, it involves, an, I think a musculoskeletal impairment rating involves an in-person evaluation with a thorough physical examination focused on those aspects of the examination that the guidelines or the guides uh, use to determine impairment rating. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the upper extremity is broken up into these four uh, areas for impairment rating evaluation, digit and hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder. Uh, next. And the guides now, at least the sixth edition for shoulder and elbow, really emphasize a diagnosis-based impairment evaluation, which I think previously was uh, only in the lower extremity and spine. And various diagnoses are grouped according to the tissue types listed as listed here from the lowest to highest value. So those soft tissue injuries or soft tissue disorders, uh, there isn't much impairment to be gained or to rate. And then as you get to ligament, bone, and joint, they are higher values. Uh, next slide. And then uh, there's a, there are these grids. Uh, the DBI is a diagnosis-based impairment. And the grids include classes that are diagnoses-based uh, with diagnosis base, and they have ranges of assigned impairment ratings. And you can see uh, under class one, the range of impairment that you could have is 1% to 13%, and they'll over on class four, it's 50% to 100% upper extremity impairment. Uh, next slide. And these uh, uh, ratings are adjusted up or down by considering the various modifiers, which include functional history, physical examination, and clinical studies, so that you can make adjustments within these classes. And for example, this is the, the grid for uh, rotator cuff injury and full thickness tear, which is considered a class one um, diagnosis and the only impairment or maximum impairment that you could obtain with a rotator cuff tear is 13%. Uh, next slide. However, there are some exceptions and I think this is really relevant to shoulder and elbow and that is you can assess impairment with, with motion loss. And sometimes that's really relevant with the patient who has a rotator cuff disorder who may have significant limitations of motion and that, rate, that may give them a higher impairment rating than the diagnosis base. Uh, so when you do this, you, it's called a standalone, meaning that the range of motion impairment is not combined with a diagnosis impairment. So there may be an impairment based on their diagnosis, but you would use the range of motion assessment instead. And then there is uh, combined values is another aspect of uh, that I'm actually not going to get into because of the time allotted here. But uh, there are instances where you will combine different aspects to uh, gain your impairment rating. Uh, next slide. Uh, Pain-related impairment uh, was, uh, I think, just brought up in the fifth edition, 
And it, I think it's quite controversial. That's obviously there's no objective way to quantify pain or its effects on individuals. But what the fifth edition did was indicate that you could apply pain related impairment, uh, but they capped it at 3%. So it's very small contribution to impairment. And uh, there's a recommendation in the guides to use a pain disability questionnaire to assess patient's pain and how it might relate to their impairment. The next slide. Um, we also look at impairment uh, as a, either a regional or whole person impairment. And generally, uh, the, in my experience, the um, uh, workers' compensation carriers are looking for the upper extremity impairment, but I, they, there is a whole person impairment as well. And this reflects the severity of the organ or body system impairment and its resulting functional limitation on the whole person. I think this is, at least in my opinion, very controversial because these are somewhat arbitrary um, uh, percentages applied to this different disorders. And so an upper extremity disorder involving the shoulder and elbow could be converted to a whole person by multiplying it by 0.6, so it's 60%. Uh, next slide. Um, apportionment, I'm really not gonna get into the details, but apportionment comes up occasionally um, often with whether someone had a pre-existing condition or if someone has changed their job from one company to another and the current car carrier would say, well, you know, isn't uh, their rotator cuff problem because they did heavy lifting at their previous job and we want you to apportion that or they have an underlying rotator cuff condition that was pre-existing and could you tell us what percentage of their current injury it, uh, is re related. And I think this really comes down to, so it's allocation of causation when there are multiple factors that cause or significantly contributed to the injury or disease and resulting impairment. And this usually comes down to uh, who's going to pay for what and how much they're going to pay. Uh, next slide. So just in summary, this, this is a quick overview. A musculoskeletal impairment rating is really a quasi-objective quantitative measure uh, that is determined at the point of maximal medical improvement in a patient's uh, care. Uh, they're generally diagnosis-based impairment methods. Uh, they're impairment classes that categorize how much impairment a specific disease or injury entity will have. And then these can be adjusted based upon their functional history, their physical examination, and their clinical studies, such as x-rays, EMG, MRI. Uh, and then I will point out that at least for shoulder and elbow, I think range of motion is an exception to the diagnosis-based impairment that uh, you should consider. Uh, next slide. So thank you for your attention. Uh, that, I think that was a quick overview and hopefully we'll get into some more details with the cases and questions. That was a great presentation. Those, those are three terrific presentations. Do we have any questions from the chat thus far, guys? We, we do not. We do not. I think people are in awe of everything you guys have said. <laughs> the tension's palpable. <laughs> okay, let's just go back to that first case that I showed you. Um, hold on, my computer's slowing down. There we go. So here's our, here's our guy who uh, has this irreparable tear. The surgery, uh, to refresh your memory, was done one month after the injury at an outside place. And on further history, as the IME rating physician, um, there, uh, for the, the physician at the IME, there was an injury 10 years earlier of a rotator cuff strain that resolved with rehabilitation and, and no surgery. So at this point, uh, there is, this is a, a heavy laborer, has a pre-existing injury, clearly has a large pre-existing tear that was diagnosed as an acute tear, but he had surgery approved under the industrial carrier. So, so Matt, you're doing, you're doing your IME. Um, you know, what are you, what are you thinking at this point in time? Yeah, Evan. So obviously it's, it's a pre-existing tear just based on the irre irreparable nature and the MRI finding. So really it's my goal to, um, you know, determine whether there was a substantial aggravation or not. And I'd have to look back at, at the mechanism because this may be a situation where this is just a mere manifestation of a chronic tear that was there and, and it may not be related. 
Um, but if there was a, a specific injury, then maybe it was an aggravation. Um, so that would be the first thing I would think about. And then the second part, uh, of course, is, is an SCR reasonable or not? And in this manual labor and SCR or lower trapezius transfer or something along those lines or non-operative treatment with permanent restrictions would be the, the three things that I would think would probably be reasonable for this individual. Yeah, so without getting into the specific treatment, uh, the next issue, Kevin, so this guy has a pre-existing care. I think if you saw any one of us, we would probably hesitate to rush into surgery, but he was approved to go to surgery and a surgery was performed uh, under the work comp claim. Um, and the physician did some debridement and, and what have you. So does that have any influence? Does, does the, the treatment received, regardless of the causation, if it's approved under industrial, have any influence on how you would uh, uh, determine causation? Well, no, I think treatment rendered and causation are really two different things. Um, going back to my uh, slides, uh, yes, as Matt pointed out, this is clearly a pre-existing condition and whether his injury 10 years ago uh, has any play in this, in, in, my, in my opinion, is immaterial unless the carrier decides to try to go for apportionment. The elevator repairman here was uh, doing his job and had no symptoms until he had a work-related event. So at least in the state of Connecticut, what we would say is that the work injury is a substantial factor in the need for treatment. And then the uh, carrier is on the hook for the whole treatment. Um, I, and again, I, I wanna emphasize that this is something that varies from state to state. And in you know the Southwest United States, it depends on what what's been adjudicated and it's above and beyond the medical treatment it's all about what the usual and customary years or what the statutes say or what legal precedent has been set. You know, so in terms of treatment, um, uh, that's that again, that's immaterial toward causality. So, so that's a great point. And, uh, you know, one thing interesting for, for our listeners is that this case uh, did go to IME. It did go to trial over what was done. And whenever there's a trial, that means there's always pretty much two IMEs. One IME will agree with the plaintiff's case and want to support the care. And the other IME, which will be obtained usually by the uh, defendant, in this case, an insurance company or, or the company, if they're self-insured, will usually justify not recommending treatment under the industrial, uh, under the industrial claim for all the reasons we can all justify when we look at this uh, superficially. So, so nonetheless, this, this went to trial and was approved for treatment and, and to move forward to some of our other issues, that's what he looked like at the first surgery and that's what he looked like at the second surgery. Uh, a superior capsular reconstruction was done regardless of what the best treatment option would be. And then at eight months post-op, uh, this gentleman had fairly good uh, range of motion and function and had reasonable strength with a little bit of weakness. So he's approaching MMI at this point in time and he wants to go back to work. So in, in our state, in Arizona, uh, we'll get a letter like this. And whether you're the IME physician or the treating physician, uh, they'll, they'll ask a causation statement and you'll have to say something. And our, our standard in Arizona is a reasonable degree of medical probability, which means 51% as opposed to medical certainty, as Matt uh, mentioned, which is 95%, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And then they might ask in the IME, the pre-existing condition, has treatment been appropriate? Recommendations for further treatment? Are they permanent stationary? And then this point, which we didn't touch on too much, is can the injured person return to their pre-injury occupation? If not, what are their restrictions? Are they temporary or permanent? And then is there a permanent impairment you know, uh, to the extremity of the whole person? And we have to do something called scheduled and unscheduled. I don't know if you guys have that in yours. And a scheduled award is generally an extremity award and is a fixed sum of money provided to the uh, patient based upon their uh, impairment rating, and then an unscheduled award, which typically would be an axial skeletal war, uh, issue, a spine, and in our state, the shoulder, uh, where they actually don't get a set amount as they get a payment monthly for life based upon their impairment rating. So it's very expensive to the insurers. And then the last thing about supportive care or potential future care. So um, I, I don't know if this is the same in your states, but I wanted to ask 
uh, about uh, restrictions of work. So Andy, how do you can what do you think about when the patient asks you, can they go to work? Um, and what kind of restrictions, how do you think about putting restrictions on people without getting too in the weeds? So it obviously depends on what they have to do at work. And typically I will say, it's actually fairly uncommon, I think, but there are patients who I think are probably maybe pushing the limits of what their shoulder or elbow can do. But I tell them, you know, if you feel comfortable, I'm happy to let you go back to work. Here are the potential ramifications of that. Um, you know, the reality is that doesn't happen that often, but um, I'm, I don't think that's a problem for me if they feel comfortable uh, doing that. The, the, other thing, the other thing you can do is, uh, you know, sometimes it's a question of whether they want to go back or not, or the employer is going to take them back. Uh, you can have them get a functional capacity evaluation, uh, which in our state, there's actually the state has a facility that's set up to do that, no cost to the insurance carriers, uh, which is very helpful, actually, in the more difficult cases where a patient's actually seems to be doing pretty well, but you can't get them back to work. Um, that can be helpful to at least give you some objective evidence to support uh, a, a recommendation. Do Matt, Kevin, do you guys do use functional capacity evaluations with any degree of frequency? Sometimes I do. Um, I'm like Andy, if I'm treating the patient and they tell me they want to go back to work and they understand the inherent risks, I, I don't do a FC in that situation. I let them go back and just give them a trial of full duty. Um, we have some, we don't have a, a statewide thing, but we have some good physical therapy groups that will do a functional assessment. So it's basically like an end of work conditioning and they'll give you what parameters they can do, what they can't do and what percentage of their job they will do. So sometimes I'll use that uh, to determine a disability. And then if I'm really not sure or restrictions, I should say, excuse me, if I'm not sure um, where they're at and they're sort of unwilling to go back, then I will request a functional capacity evaluation at FCE. Kevin, anything to add? Um, the only thing that I have to add, at least in our state, is that some of the therapists and the, the comp commission is going along with this, will transition you from standard physical therapy to a work conditioning program. Yeah. And a lot of times the work conditioning program uh, done in conjunction with what the job description is will lead you to where you are you want to go. And that work conditioning program will end up with, let's say you can do 50 pounds to your chest and 20 pounds above your chest and that sort of thing. And that's where you're stuck. And then actually your injured worker can see during that process where they max out. And so everybody then becomes in agreement with it. The FCE seems to be a little bit um, almost argumentative and the, the patients oftentimes don't like it. Uh, but if you put them through this process where they can actually see what they can do um, and they may not, it may vary from state to state. Um, I, I found that that's very helpful. Yeah, that, that's typically the steps that I take work conditioning program. And then the work conditioning program ends up doing a functional capacity evaluation when they're done with them. And that helps decide that. Um, yeah. So these issues usually come up in the patient. That's a little more difficult because a lot of them just want to go back to work and our standard for, for work restrictions are based upon the pre-injury occupation. So if the pre-injury occupation is uh, that they're, they're working at a call center and sit at a desk, you know, and they still got some pain when they lift 50 pounds, they go back to regular duty, even they don't need those restrictions. And that's a standard in Arizona uh, that's specific to the, to the job done at the time of injury, not the job that they're doing currently. They may so have just, different... just one uh, suggestion to, um, you know, our new doctors. You know, as a treating physician, sometimes what happens is that patient who doesn't quite want to know, want to go back to work, doesn't really know what that means. And uh, a lot of times when I see somebody who seems to be behind in the program, I counsel them to say, look, you know, in a couple of months, you're going to be at MMI, I'm going to give you permanent restrictions. And, and then you're on your own. And then you got two strikes against you because you got permanent restrictions and you got to put those on every job application that you fill out from here on out. And, you know, sometimes psychology comes into play here and all of a sudden they, they have a, what I call a come to Jesus moment that, uh, you know, Hey, I better, uh, I, I better go back to work. And sometimes that's very helpful. 
that may be a little bit off uh, script, but I think it's helpful. I think that will depend a lot. That depends a lot on how old they are. At least in my state, um, we have a lot of these, like the elevator repair guy, uh, 50, 60 year old laborers who this is their this was their last straw, and it doesn't matter what you do, they're probably not going to go back to work. I agree with that, Andy. But sometimes it's a 35 year old elevator yeah, repairman who's really loving drinking beer and watching TV for a year. And, and they need to realize that, that uh, they got some more working years uh, to coming. And, uh, you know, it's not really our job to put them back to work or not go back to work. No. We say what their restrictions are, and then it's up to them and their employer. And that's part of the discussion too. Uh, is I'm not going to say you can't work. You can have no legs and you can still go back to work. <laughs> and, uh, and then they start getting it. The other thing I'll tell them sometimes, is listen, you have a rotator cuff tear. It was a bad tear, but it healed. I'm going to give you a 5% impairment regardless of whether you go back to work or not. So you might as well do your best to go back to work and make some more money. <laughs> and that sometimes works too. doesn't it's always really work. Important. It's really critically important to understand the statutes in your state. Yes. That determines a lot of this. When I first went into practice, Rhode Island had gone through a crisis where all the workers' comp carriers dropped the coverage because... They had a, the way that things were paid out. If you were partially uh, disabled, you got paid forever. And they stopped, they basically got rid of that. And now if you're partially disabled, there's a maximum of five years that you can collect. So there's a time, once you, as soon as the patient is rendered partially disabled, the clock starts. And it, may, it actually made a big difference here. So I'm gonna move hey, on, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Evan, we've got a question from one yeah, of the yeah. attendees. Um, how far into practice should we be before we consider taking on this aspect of practice? And, and, so and I'll share my opinion. You know, the first thing they ask you in a deposition is, doctor, are you board certified? Um, at least in our state. And if you say no, then you probably, probably nobody listens to you after that. So I think if you're going to take on legal opinions and end up in front of a judge, you should be at least board certified. What about the rest of you? If you could each weigh in on the questions, that would be most helpful. I agree with Evan. Uh, you know, you, you need to be board certified. You know, you it, it whether you're um, board certified or not, it, it's a good housekeeping seal of approval. And it, if you're not board certified for whatever reason, uh, the deposition oftentimes ends right there because you're not qualified as an expert in our state. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, that's a minimum requirement, but I'm, so I'm 12 years into practice and I really didn't do any IMEs or legal work until I was probably my fifth or sixth year. I think um, you want to have your footing, you want to feel comfortable in your practice, you, you, you need to have some expertise and some, um, you know, weight to your CV, I think, in order to offer these opinions. And to be honest, this type of work is not for everyone. I have partners that are in the later years of practice and they wouldn't touch this with the 10 foot pole. They just don't want the headache. They don't like dealing with all of you know these definitions and with lawyers and depositions. And then I have other partners that this is a big part of their practice and it, it's, um, you know, they help in the process and they can make some extra money doing it too. So you, know, you have to decide whether you really have um, the stomach for this. And, and I would say maybe five years is a good time uh, to start considering it at the earliest. I think that's a great answer. Um, I've asked a few personal injury as well as uh, malpractice attorneys, and they say five, year, five years is the earliest um, because you need to be, have said you've done the procedures enough times so that it, may, it carries some weight. Next question for the group is that what's the most effective way to advocate for patients who you think are getting the runaround from work comp? For example, for instance, a surgery is not getting approved, but you think is appropriately indicated. So I'll Andy, tell you, I'll take that. Oh, go ahead, Andy. So I'm going to answer it as the IME uh, examiner. If, and I think Bill commented something that I agree with. If I, you give your opinion, if you think the patient should have the treatment or they're getting in appropriate treatment, be clear about that in your IME report. Uh, Sometimes I will call the uh, person who referred the patient for the IME directly and make a recommendation. And then uh, Bill, I see Bill said, and then I do that also with patients who are not getting good care. I will let the adjuster or the referring 
uh, Anthony know that this they're having inappropriate care. You do have to be careful how you word things in your reports, but a phone call is a way around it. But it's important to, to uh, protect patients too. They're not your patient, but I think you have a, a moral obligation or ethical obligation as a physician uh, to intervene in that setting. So as a, as a treating physician, the, the only thing that I found that's effective is keep seeing the patient. If you create a trail of monthly or uh, every three week visits where you recommend the same thing, then the claimant's work, workers' compensation attorney can go to the commissioner and present a, a ream of data that Dr. Shea has seen this patient six times since he made the recommendation and the recommendation stands. And so all you can really do is give you the uh, attorney ammunition to put before the commissioner to say that the insurance company is not living up to their obligation. Next. One other avenue is, if I may just uh, briefly, is, is many of these um, claimants have a case manager, a nurse case manager. So I'm frequently uh, in communication with them. And especially when you're a treater, if you feel strongly, you should tell them, say, you know, this is really the, the right thing to do. And then they can sometimes go back and advocate. And especially if you have integrity in the community and they trust your opinion, sometimes that can carry some weight. Next question for the group. What do you, what do you find the role of the functional capacity evaluation? When do you use them and when, and, and do you ever ask for them? So I think we covered that a little bit. Uh, for the most part, I think it's in the, the difficult case when there is a disconnect between what you feel the patient can do and what they feel they can do is you can get objective measurements or if there is a, a uh, conflict with an IME physician and, and you or um, or, or in other cases, you have somebody who's really been badly injured, say multiple fractures or something like that, and you really don't know what they can and can't do, and they got to go back to a position. So it's, it's a way to get objective evidence. It will also pull out malingerers. They have a, a variety of ways to test for malingering and poor effort during the test, and uh, it, can, it can be used to draw them out. So you may know your patient's a malingerer. You have to be the good guy and take care of your patient but there's ways that you can uh, let the system work uh, to adjudicate things properly. Great. Any final comments from the, from the group before we end tonight's session? I'll finish real quick on that. We, the guy was discharged, went back to regular duty, elevator repairman. Uh, his impairment rating was, give, I gave him a maximum impairment rating for rotator cuff tear because he had an irreparable tear despite the SCR. And then we didn't talk about supportive care, but at closure, whether you're the IME or the treating physician, you also recommend supportive care, which is future expected surveillance care. So if you do, if you fix a fracture, a uh, clavicle fracture, and they're completely better, they don't need much supportive care. If you're dealing with uh, chronic rotator cuff disease, they may need follow-up care and maintenance. And this can be done under closed treatment for, for long-term. And then in Arizona, we can't hand out lifelong supportive care. It's handed out in blocks of time, two years, three years, five years, and then reassessed after that time. And for a case like this, when I know they may need a reverse in the future, I put it in the paperwork now because it can be referenced years later. So uh, the other thing we didn't talk about is the, the ODG or the, uh, uh, the disability guidelines and frequently your treatment uh, will be referenced to this source. We don't have time to talk about it now, but if you're gonna do these kind of things, become familiar with the ODG guidelines. Anybody uh, come up against these very often? So this is, so the ODG guidelines say a rotator cuff repair requires 20 physical therapy visits. And on the 21st visit, they try to discharge them and they cut off all their care, things like that. It's a very interesting thing to look at. So we'll skip the rest of the cases and I think we'll call this to a conclusion. I wanna thank uh, the panel. This was a fantastic uh, introduction to IMEs and uh, I appreciate being part of it. Thank you all for your efforts in your lectures. Thank you, everyone, for yeah. signing in. And please join us next week uh, for the session on work-life integration. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We had a lot of fun. Thanks, guys.